Tylea's Troubles, Special Video 3, A Cornucopia of Pikes. The last two behind the scenes modelling and painting specials seemed to be well received, so I thought I'd have a go at another one. As this is a Tylean campaign, I reckoned I needed pikemen and plenty of them. I've already shown you my goblin pikes in the first special video about my green skin kit bashers and scratch builds. But of course, my human pikemen models were to become far more numerous. I already owned a regiment that I'd used in a bunch of old campaigns, including the Animosity campaigns from Animosity 3 onwards. These models featured in my most recent video, I think it's part 39, parading through Remas before the crowds and the high clergy. And it was their appearance that made me think of putting this Pike-tastic special together. Their old glory miniatures from their 25mm Italian Wars, Swiss and Italian range. These are, like all my figures until about two years ago, painted in enamels. Black undercoated to allow my black lining, then cartoon blocking style on the top. They've been modified several times over the years to show different allegiances in different campaigns. Their flags, uh, their pike shafts and even their clothes have changed colours. Way back, they were the Black Company's pike regiments in a Warhammer Empire Forum offshoot thread called the Border Princes IC2524, linked to the Solend effort. I admit that's quite confusing. Basically, there was a, a story campaign thread called the Solend effort, and this spawned a separate Border Princes thread as the story's events crossed over into other parts of the old world after which the two threads ran simultaneously for a while, with some forces crossing from one thread to the other by crossing the mountains from one realm to the other. Here you can see the old glory miniatures, along with other pikemen of other old rangers, including a frontline rank of Michael and Alan Perry Wars of the Roses models that I got from Citadel Miniatures ages ago, but that are now available from War Games Foundry. The Black Raven Banner was as a campaign player described it. He and I were in conflict in the story, but he lived on another continent, so I converted some of my figures to be his troops and fought the battle with a friend, commanding the enemy. Here they are, closing in on the Middenheimers. To be honest, I can't remember whether my soldiers were actually Middenheimers, operating the Border Princes, or if they were a local state that happened to have blue and white livery. It's a long time ago. They are Tylean Pavonans in my current campaign. This picture, from the same battle report, became kind of famous for a couple of years. Well, at least I think so. It was used by a local war games club, where I played the actual game. And the image got somehow caught up in the Google algorithm of the time, so that whenever I typed Warhammer Fantasy Battle in an image search, this appeared either at or near the top. I never found out whether the placing was just for me or for everyone. I think I was just happy to assume it was for everyone and I didn't want to burst my own bubble. Anyway, I still think it's a cool picture. Something to do with the angle and the composition. Entirely random, of course. I just tend to snap away with the camera and hope for the best. A few campaigns later, these models featured in the Treachery and Greed campaign as an early incarnation of the Tylean mercenary force known as the Compagna del Sole. Here they are, parading, their baton and half-sun emblem on their standard. You can see they, they must have served with my Middenheim army at some point in the meantime, as their pike shafts have been painted with livery blue and white. They're flying a real silk flag. That silk was cut from a handkerchief that my grandma gave me. I hope she didn't mind. It was very delicate. I used another piece recently to repair a coat and it just fell apart within days. At the back there are some models from yet another War of the Roses range but for the life of me I can't recall the manufacturer. I, I had them these way back in the early 1980s. Now that I was running a Tylean campaign with umpteen non-player character ruled city-states all having their own standing armies although some were only small I obviously needed more pike regiments. Pikes are supposed to be the arme blanche of uh, Tylean foot soldiers. I decided I should paint these in a variety of colours like militia so that I could use them for different NPC states as necessary. There are also regiments in uh, every settlement standing force. This is a technical campaign rules term 
different from the idea of a standing army. A standing force is meant to be the local populace's militia, like early modern English trained bands, whereas the standing army is whatever marching army a state keeps in being during times of peace. A professional corps of soldiers to police the state in times of peace and from which a bigger army can grow in times of emergency. Uh, taught by the professional sergeants and officers uh, of that standing army. It seemed to me that there would probably be a traditional composition to such standing armies, a kind of Tylean norm, a regiment or two of melee troops, usually pike, maybe swords, a company of horse, either light or heavy, some missile companies, either crossbow or handgun or longbows, a piece of artillery and two or three characters, one being an engineer to tend the gun and to supervise the acquisition and maintenance of new guns in times of emergency. Some NPC states would also have a, a, a unique unit or two, linked to their history or their geographical position. I presumed magic users, however, would tend to be recruited from what was available at, at the time of war. The first bunch of new pikemen were part of the Viadazan peasant army that has already featured in the videos. They didn't need conversion, and they were to be painted in my usual cell-shaded style, in my usual medium of enamels. These models do seem somewhat odd to me, something about their poses or their proportions, but I like them all the more for it. They're from War Games Foundry's Casting Room Miniatures range. Foundry don't include them in the normal catalogue, but instead have a separate Casting Room Miniatures uh, website for the whole range. It's linked on their main page. As they're inspired by historical Renaissance Italian soldiers, they're equipped just right for my campaign and I had to get them as soon as I saw them. Because they're militia, they wear every colour under the sun. And somehow, against expectation, this fact seemed, well, to me at least, to tie them together. The models came without pikes, I think. So I bought a cheap, plastic, brown bristled brush, cut off a bunch of the bristles and added chopped off spear tips to them. These are used as is, so that they can bend and not snap, they spring back after being bent, and there's no paint to chip off. They don't hurt either when you accidentally rub your arm against them or rest your hand on them, like the steel or brass ones do. All these were bonuses in my book. I just wish the bristles were a bit longer. I recommend this method, and I've used the same bristles on other models, like my skeleton spears. The trick is to use a tiny drill to drill up into the bottom of a bits box chopped off spear tip and then you push the bristle up into the hole with a blob of glue on the end to fix it. As I said earlier, these models were part of the Viadazan Crusade army raised in the city when the Morite priests preached their holy war against the vampires. They were later in a story where they were held up for a while at the bridge of Pontremola and then even later they were at the battle of uh, Pontremola, nominally commanded by Father Biagino. That was the battle where the uh, vampire duke died. With an ever-growing number of NPC states actively involved in the theatres of war, joining with other NPCs and players in large alliance armies, I needed more and more militia. I'd already made a sword and buckler type regiment the kind of soldiers that in the campaign I, I, I came to call Bravi, using casting room miniatures and War Games foundry models, which I later expanded with Perry miniatures models. Later still, I made a regiment of fully armoured swordsmen with shields to be foot men-at-arms or dismounted horse soldiers. Several times, especially when assaulting a castle or a walled city. Players instructed me that their mounted knights would fight on foot. But they didn't have the figures for that, so I needed these figures for the player characters' uh, forces as well. But Pike was supposed to be the king in Tylea. Although, to be totally honest, I've yet to see them warrant their points cost in just about any war games ever. The rules look great, but in reality, they perform pretty much meh. I think it might actually be that I'm just a very mediocre commander. Anyway, I got myself some new pike figures. These are artisan designs models, and I think they've become my favourite pike models, but probably because they're just the newest. I threw in some Perry miniatures models to add some variety so that the pictures would look more convincing. And to complete the militia standing forces look, I painted some new crossbow models, 
mostly made up of Perry Miniatures models, but also some Grenadier Fantasy models, now available from Merleton Miniatures. Here are several brightly garbed militia regiments together. I think they look a rather lovely force. I have to admit, however, that the new pike made the old pike look a bit, well, pikely challenged. The pike make for a great marching unit in this story scene, which will appear later in the campaign as part of the Verezan marching army. But why stop here? I decided later that Verezzo needed more recruits, made up from its halfling populace. I'd already got a, a couple of uh, halfling archer units, but I, of course I wanted pikes. Here you can see three of them, all having had their hands and arms chopped and repositioned to shoulder pikes, in a manner similar to the shouldered pose that was already provided on the sprue. These are made from the relatively new War Games Atlantic box set, converted to make a regiment of 36, all carrying shouldered pikes and not just the eight standard models plus command. Marching poses work better in way more stories and perfectly well on the battlefield. Eight more pikes were converted, as on the sprue they are charging pikes, and I wanted all of them shoulders. Eight models had a shouldered hal halberd, which was quite easy to swap for a pike. This left four models yet to be modelled and painted, which I intended to use for later picture poses and characters. In fact, I I'm working on one, one right now as Barone Iacopo. The modelling took me ages. It was so fiddly. I used plastic brush bristles for some of the pikes and shaved lances for others. I chopped the spear tips off anything I could find in my bits box. Positioning the arms and hands was the hardest part. I was really fed up of working with them by the time I'd done the modelling. So I put them aside and did several other projects before I rediscovered the motivation to paint them. I liked the effect of them all together and I was keen on the idea that they would probably be fairly unique in the wargaming world. Surely no one else would be insane enough to attempt to convert one box in this excruciatingly slow manner. If I was richer, I'd have bought four boxes and just used the shouldered pike arms. I have since seen that other, far more sensible and cash-rich hobbyists have indeed done exactly this. I attempted a painting method I recently had some success with, but which, after this experiment, I decided I wasn't going to use again. I wanted to avoid enamels for health reasons. 35 years of breathing the white spirit I cleaned the brushes with, Evaporating from the tissues that I'd used to clean the brushes under a hot lamp is probably quite enough fumes. So I white undercoated in acrylic paint the flesh areas and washed watered down flesh on them, intending to highlight them later. I thought this would add subtlety to the faces. It turned out that I was no good at it at all, so it really didn't work. I then undercoated the rest of the model in black enamel, over which I painted everything in my usual cartoon style using base coat acrylics. That part seemed to work OK. The acrylics were going on fine. Even, to my surprise, the yellow. Here you can see some of the models in the early blue and yellow stage. Later, having had to grapple with them a lot to, to add various other colours, the, the leather and armour, etc., I realised my mistake. Previously, with enamels, and for 35 years, I just removed the flash lines, cleaned the figures up, undercoated with black, left this to dry for a couple of days, then slapped the paint on. Occasionally, for some effect or other, I'd, I'd undercoat in white. I never had to prime. The enamel black undercoat was perfectly adequate as a primer. Now, I realised, as chunks of acrylic paint were coming away on the flesh areas, why I should have primed when painting with acrylics. And so I had to repair with more white paint and just hope for the best with this regiment in the long-term future. The fact that they would probably all die if ever they fought in my current campaign meant they only had to survive one or two tabletop games and a few posed story photos. I persisted, nevertheless, repairing as I painted, trying to make acrylics work the way enamels had always done for me. Since then, I've spray-primed everything first, just like everyone told me to when I switched to acrylics. In terms of rules, I knew that they couldn't really be considered the same as normal pikes. As you can see from this picture, there's quite some difference in length. This time, they were way more pikely challenged than that first batch of human militia. But luckily, the Tylean campaign army list we use, based on an old uh, Empire Forum offshoot campaign called Treachery and Greed, 
like an unofficial online campaign list for uh, Tylean armies. Uh, that list specified that halflings could use dwarf pikes with special rules, so everything was going to be okay. They, they didn't have the depth, they couldn't fight in quite as many ranks, and they didn't have all the advantages, but they added something spears wouldn't add. I based them singly for the front rank, two pairs and two singles for the rear, while the middle four ranks are based on two by two squares, just for convenience. And the shape still works when you uh, lay them out to march. Here you can see I'd yet to flock the bases, and I must admit I, I noticed a spear tip yes, yet to paint. I missed it until I saw the pics. And I wanted to do uh, some corrective work on the commander's faces. I, I seemed to have increasingly unsteady hands, and I really didn't know what I was doing with the acrylic paints. But they are almost complete here. I was more than satisfied with them. Indeed, I now wanted more halflings. Could Verezzo become a halfling-based superpower? Here, I lined them up in a column, making rum-ti-tum drumming noises like a little kid as I laid them out. But they really came onto their own when they featured in a scene where they were drilling on the village green. These pictures will appear in the videos in the far future, but I don't mind showing you them here because they're already on my YouTube channel as the banner and the logo. Even the Sartosan pirates in my campaign decided to use pikes for their land battles, and thus this half-converted body of War Games Foundry pirate pike. Thanks to Damien, my Porto Majorum player, for gifting me a whole bunch of metal pirate models. These were a devil to rank up and required some careful planning. They ended up looking quite a disorganised bunch, but that seemed somewhat appropriate. Pirates aren't necessarily the most disciplined of troops. Of course, they had to learn how to use the pikes, drilling under the instructions of some comrades who had served in the Port City militias before turning pirate. I think that's all my pikes. Maybe I could do some rat men pikes next time. I'll be back to making my story videos as soon as possible. The next one being part 39. Oh, that means earlier on when I said it was part 39. I was wrong, it must have been part 38. I don't know, I've lost track. And like I said in the previous special, but I've never put in the story videos, if you like my Big Small Worlds um, and my Tylian campaign story and videos, then please do like and subscribe and whatnot, whatever it is people do, and maybe tell like-minded friends about the channel if you think they would enjoy this niche of a niche of a fantasy war games campaign experiment.